Open us in a word of prayer and we'll begin. Father God, thank you for your word. We pray, Lord, that we would study it, that we would understand it more clearly, and that we would teach it accurately. We give you all the glory. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. The question that I want to take up this morning is, does God chasten believers during the dispensation of grace? Does God chasten believers during the dispensation of grace? So let's think through this. So what many believe today is that God chastens believers today for their disobedience. So what do I mean by that? The idea is that when believers commit sins that are significant, God brings some physical consequence in their life. So, for example, they commit some serious sin and they then suffer a loss of employment. Or they suffer some physical malady as a result of sin in their life. A saying that people sometimes use is, God will collect his tithe in hospital bills. So, in other words, if I'm not giving properly as I should, God's reaction to that is... He punishes me, he chastens me, corrects me by causing these circumstances in my life, these calamities or other things. And so the question that we're going to look at, and we'll spend enough time to, to try to understand the issue, is does God chasten believers during the dispensation of grace? There are five points that I want to cover. Let me tell you what these are, and then we'll look at them individually. Point number one the scriptural definition of chastening. So we're going to look at what the scriptures say and as to what chastening is and how, how that word is defined. The second thing we'll look at is the transdispensational truth that God chastens his sons. The third thing is we'll look at the key Pauline chastening verse, which is 1 Corinthians 11.32. Point number four, we'll look at correction requiring specificity. We'll understand what that means. And then five, we'll look at the manner in which God chastens during the dispensation of grace. So we want to get through all of that, so let's go ahead and jump in. So the first thing that we want to do is we need to understand the scriptural definition of chastening. So get with me Job, and we're going to look at Job 5, verse 17. Job 5, verse 17. Now, while you're getting there, I'll, I'll make this point. How do you figure out what words mean? When you're studying Bible topics, I'm going to suggest there's, there's two basic things that you should do. The first is, the, the simplest and, and most common way that we understand what words mean in life is we look in a dictionary. And that just, you know, is obvious and that makes sense. So when you're trying to understand any Bible word, it's always good to look at a dictionary. But the second thing that you want to do is you want to look to see if the Scriptures tell you, if the Scriptures give you definition, if give you understanding of what a word means. And what I'm going to do with you for the next several minutes is I'm going to show you several verses that I think define for us what chastening means as it's used in the Scriptures. So Job 5, verse 17. Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore, despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty." Now, when you read that verse, and you, for example, if you pay careful attention to the therefore, it tells you in that verse what chastening is. What is it? It's correction, right? And if you just read the verse and you understand what it's saying, Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth, therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. Isn't it very obvious from the way this, that verse is structured that chastening lines up with correction and that that's what it's telling you. 
Get Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 11. Proverbs 3, 11. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. So yet again, we see a parallelism between chastening and correction. Get Psalm 94, verse 10. Psalms chapter 94 and verse 10. He that chastiseth the heathen shall not he correct. He that teacheth man knowledge shall not he know. Do you, do you, hopefully you notice this. What, what the Bible does time and time again is it will use parallelism to tell you what words mean, to tell you how to, it's using phrases. Well, when you look at Psalm 94, verse 10, you can see that chastiseth is equivalent to correction. He that chastiseth the heathen shall not he correct. You can see the parallelism there. Get Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And we'll look at verse 5. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Now when you look at those verses there, you notice that the word chastening is used in verse 5. It's used in verse 6. It's used in verse 7. The subject of those verses is obviously chastening, right? I mean, that's, that's fairly clear. Well, read verse 8. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Now, verse 8 is not a typo. It uses the word chastisement. But isn't it fairly obvious from verses 5, 6, and 7 that the subject is chastening and in verse 8, it's telling you that chastisement is an equivalent term. Now, let me just pause there for a minute before we go on. Everyone understands that there are synonyms in life, right? In other words, there are words that are different words that have the same meaning. People sometimes come to the Scriptures and they think, well, if those are different words, they must necessarily have different meanings. Is that true? Well, it's not true. So let me give you a simple example, Romans 4. But to him that worketh not, but believeth, his faith is counted for righteousness. What does faith mean in that context? Belief. Are faith and belief the same thing? They are, right? For by grace are you saved through faith, what did Paul say to the Philippians jailer in Acts 16? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Okay? That's why I just want you to think carefully about this. It is a superstition that if you look at two words and they're different words, they must necessarily mean different things. That's simply not true. Faith and belief are used interchangeably. We've already seen here that correction and chastening are used interchangeably. Look with me at verse 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, and then notice what it says, which corrected us. 
and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Verse 10. Now, let's do verse 9 one more time. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us. So it's saying in past tense, we've had fathers and they have corrected us. Now look at verse, that's 9, verse 10. For they verily for a few days chastened us. Well, isn't it obvious that chastening and correction are being used interchangeably? Okay, so what these verses tell us is that chastening means the same thing as correction, means the same thing as chastisement. The words are used interchangeably. Now that's helpful because it gives us clarity as to what God is using those words to mean and what He's trying to say. So we're in Hebrews 12. Let's go to point number two. It is transdispensational truth that God chastens His sons. Okay, so what does the word transdispensational mean? So let me ask you this. If we look at the chart, is transdispensational truth vertical or horizontal? It's horizontal, right? So give me an example of a vertical truth. What you eat. As you think about what you eat, does it differ at different places on the timeline? It does. And an example of a transdispensational truth is God is holy. Is there ever a time where God is not holy? He always is. Is another transdispensational truth is flee idolatry. Is there any time on the timeline where idolatry is okay? No. So what we see is there are some revelations that are given where it's given for a specific point in time and it may change. It changes with regard to diet. It changes with regard to animal sacrifice. It changes with regard to whether you observe the Sabbath. Those differ over time. God's character never changes. Some of His commandments never change, right, with regard to idolatry and taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain and God being holy and, and so on. Okay. Well, look with me at Hebrews 12, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. What that verse is saying is God chastens those he loves. Look with me at verse 7. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Now let's talk about that just for a minute. Should a parent discipline their child? And the answer most obviously is yes. When you discipline your child, when you punish them, are you doing that because you hate them? Are you doing that because you wish them harm? No. You're doing that because it is necessary, helpful correction. So let's take a simple example. When you forbid your child to play in the street and you discipline them when they run toward the street. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's obviously a good thing. It's designed for their benefit. You teach them not to play in the street. You teach them not to touch a hot stove. You teach them not to take candy from strangers and so on. All of those things are correction for the benefit of the child. Let me put it another way. What would happen if I didn't teach my child those things, I would be setting my child up for problems, wouldn't I? Right? If I told my child it's okay to take candy from strangers, what would I be doing? I'd be putting them in a bad spot in life, wouldn't I? I'd be subjecting them to harm. Well, just look at those verses again. 
Look at verse 7. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? I'm going to suggest to you that is a transdispensational truth. There's never a time where a parent should not correct a child. It is the loving, proper thing to do. Think of it this way. The little baby is born. What does the baby know and understand about the way the world works? Well, the answer is nothing, right? Nothing. The, the, the child needs to be taught. So the loving parent corrects the child to teach them how to operate on this earth. And if you fail to do that as a parent, you don't love the child. That's what the verse is saying. Get with me Revelation chapter 3, verse 19. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. The idea there of what God is saying is that if he loves someone, he chastens them. Get Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 5. Deuteronomy 8, 5. Deuteronomy 8, 5. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Get Proverbs 13, verse 24. Proverbs 13, verse 24. Proverbs 13, verse 24. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. What does betimes mean? Early. What's the best time to discipline a child? Should you wait till they're 17? That's, is that smart? Or is it better to teach them at a young age how to discipline them? Well, that, that's obviously the idea. So what have we seen so far in just looking at chastening? We see that God chastens those He loves. We saw that in Hebrews. We saw that in Revelation. We saw that in the Mosaic Law in Deuteronomy. We saw it in Proverbs. So you see it at all different points along the timeline. Let's look now at Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So let me ask you this then. If you're saved today, what are you? You're a son of God, right? If you are saved today, you are therefore by definition a son of God. Well, didn't we look at multiple verses about when God deals with people as sons, what does He do? He chastens them. So I would submit to you that chastening is a transdispensational truth. We see it at various points along the timeline. So let's go to point number three then. The key Pauline chastening verse is 1 Corinthians 11.32. 32. So let's turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 11.32. If you run a search of the term chasten, you'll find that Paul only uses that term twice. He uses it once in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 9, where talks about, Paul talks about being chastened yet not killed. And that is a reference to him being punished by men. What happened to Paul as he traveled? Everyone said, Paul's here, this is great. We can learn from the apostle, the Gentiles, and we'll be edified. Is that what happened? That's not what happened. Some did that, but, but many did not. So was Paul 
beaten regularly. Yes. So 2 Corinthians 6, 9, where it talks about chastened and yet not killed, that's a reference to the chastening that Paul received at the hands of men. The only real verse in Paul about chastening by God is 1 Corinthians 11, 32. Now let's just set the context before we jump into 1 Corinthians 11. The second half of 1 Corinthians 11 is about the Lord's Supper. And Paul was writing to the saints at Corinth because the saints at Corinth were not handling the Lord's Supper very well. Can anyone remember what the saints were doing? Some were overeating, yes. What else were they doing? Some were drunk. Some weren't waiting for one another, right? They were like cutting each other in front of the line and you know, some were overfed, some were hungry, some were drunk. I mean, it was, it was like a bad Super Bowl party, right? And so Paul's writing to them about that. Look with me at verse 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Now, notice verse 27 uses the word unworthily. What part of speech is unworthily? You got eight choices. I'll give you eight guesses. It's an adverb. How can you tell it's an adverb? It ends in L-Y. So the, the simple way to tell in English if something is an adverb, if it ends in L-Y, it's an adverb. Okay, so if it's an adverb, what does an adverb modify? Typically a verb, right? Okay. It can also modify an adjective. But let's look at this sentence real quick, because there's a lot of confusion about this. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily. The adverb is modifying eat and drink, isn't it? They're eating and drinking in a way that is unworthy. Why do I say this? What you typically have heard is that with regard to the Lord's Supper, you shouldn't partake of the Lord's Supper if there is unconfessed sin in your life, right? Or if you're not living right, then you're not worthy to participate in the Lord's Supper. Now, does that make any sense? Let me ask you this. Who here can say, and just go ahead and raise your hand, we'll let you come up and give a word of testimony. Who can say, yes, my, my Christian life is so spiritual, it's so deep, that I am worthy to participate in the Lord's Supper? I mean, if you have that attitude in your mind, you're just crazy, right? No one in their right mind would say that. The unworthily here is not referring to the fact that the Corinthians have sinned somewhere in their life, because news alert, everyone does. What it's referring to is the manner in which they partake of the Lord's Supper. Remember how we just talked a bit before about the way they're observing it? There's people that are drunk and that are glutton and so on. It's talking about the specific observance of the Lord's Supper, how they were doing it. Now look at verse 29. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily. Isn't it obvious what it's talking about? It's talking about the manner in which they observe the Lord's Supper. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now when it says, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, is that referring to punishment in hell? It can't be. It can't be because what happens the moment that you believe the gospel? You're sealed by the Holy Spirit. All of your sins are forgiven. You're sealed under the day of redemption. It's not the case that someone who is saved 
can lose their salvation because they improperly observe the Lord's Supper. That just doesn't make any sense. Well, then what is the damnation that's going on in verse 29? Can anyone think of a, a, a form of damnation or condemnation that you would experience as a result of improperly observing the Lord's Supper? Well, one thing we know about, what happens at the rapture? What event does the body of Christ go through immediately after the rapture? The judgment seat of Christ. So might it be relevant at the judgment seat of Christ if you observe the Lord's Supper in a manner that was unworthy? And the answer is, of course. Let me show you another potential consequence. So look at verse 30. For this cause, what's the cause in verse 30? The cause is the manner in which they were observing the Lord's Supper. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Now, I'll tell you what I used to think that verse meant. And I think I was now wrong. And I've been wrong before, and I'm sure there's things I'm still wrong on, and I'm just working through things, okay? Verse 30, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. I used to read that and say, well, okay, what that's a reference to is, well, of course, if people are overeating and drinking too much, is it any surprise that people would be weak and sickly and sleep? I mean, what happens if you eat too much at Thanksgiving? What happens? You sleep. If you drink too much, can you feel weak and sickly? Yeah. So I looked at those verses and I said, well, that's, that's just a reference in verse 30 to the natural consequence of if you engage in this behavior, this is what naturally happens. Now, the reason I don't think that anymore is look at verse 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Let me ask you this. When someone today drinks too much and then they get sick, is that because God decided to judge them? Or is that biochemistry? Well, let me ask you this. If I'm up on a ladder and I lose my balance, does God say, I'm going to punish you for your clumsiness and you are therefore going to fall and get hurt? Is that God punishing me or is that simply physics? It's physics, right? Well, what happens when you overeat and you eat too much is you don't feel well, not as a matter of God's judgment, it's just biochemistry, right? That's what it is. But verse 31 is talking about being judged. Now look at verse 32. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. So what I think happened in verse 30 is that when the Corinthians were weak and sickly and many sleep, that's not simply the result of they passed out from drinking too much. It was God's judgment upon them. And verse 31 and verse 32 tell you that, right? Because it says judged and it says chastened. So then, that raises the question, is God doing that today? Does God cause physical judgment upon saints because of sin that they do in their lives? Well, let's think about this. So, Paul mentions chastening, I said this earlier, only in 1 Corinthians 11. The reference to chastening in 2 Corinthians 6, 9 is chastening by men. The only chastening by God is in 1 Corinthians 11. Look with me at 1 Corinthians 12. What is 1 Corinthians 12 about? So what does verse 1 say it's about? Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you 
ignorant. Look at verse 9. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. Verse 10, to another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. So 1 Corinthians 12 is about spiritual gifts. Do those spiritual gifts operate today? And the answer is, they don't. Look with me at, get Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. A lot of times when you, um, when you look at a study Bible, the study Bible will frequently have an introductory section prior to each book. So in other words, it'll have some narrative and it'll say, this is the person who wrote the book, this is the time in which they wrote it, and this was the things that were going on at that time. What study Bibles often do is with the New Testament books, they will say, this book, this epistle, was written in you know, AD 54 or AD 56 or whatever. Whenever you read stuff like that, you, you should just ignore it. They, they have no idea when it is. But what you can do is you can often tell when a book is written by looking at the internal evidence of the book. So a simple example, when you read 2 Timothy 4, how do you know that 2 Timothy 4 is the last epistle Paul wrote? Well, Paul says, I'm ready to be offered. I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. He's telling you he's about to die. So it's easy to see that 2 Timothy is the last book that Paul wrote. Well, similarly, when you look at Corinthians, and I won't take the time to do this, but when you look at Corinthians, it's obvious that Corinthians is written, 1 Corinthians is written, in the Acts 19-20 context. That's the time in which it was written. Why does that matter? Look at Acts 19, verse 11. Acts 19, verse 11. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs, or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. So Acts 19, is, is it, it's certainly after Acts 9. It's after the dispensation of grace started. And is Paul performing special miracles at that point? He plainly is. But do those happen today? If you watch certain TV shows, the answer is yes. If you live in reality, the answer is no. I mean, can today, can people take handkerchiefs and bless them and say, look, here's this handkerchief that's been blessed. Just send it to your friend that's in the hospital or wherever and they'll be fine. It doesn't work that way today, does it? So what happens, and, and there's, there's no way, let me put it this way. What, what people would love to do is they love to draw a vertical line in the book of Acts, wherever it is, and say everything on this side is the kingdom program, and it's different, and then this is the dispensation of grace, and here's the sharp line, and you're either on one side or the other. You can't do that. And the reason you can't do that is that when you think about Romans 11, when it talks about the fall which is defined as what? The diminishing of Israel. Well, diminishing by its very nature, does diminishing happen in a moment or does diminishing happen over a period of time? Diminishing happens over a period of time. So when you read the book of Acts, what you're seeing is you're seeing Israel diminish. Now when you get to the end of the book of Acts, Israel has fully diminished. At that point, you're in the dispensation of grace. Or, or, or put it this way, the, the, the kingdom program, um, the kingdom program 
manifestations cease at that point. The dispensation of grace doesn't start in Acts 28. I'm sure someone will grab that clip and make a video about it, so this will be fun. Um, but just to be clear, the dispensation of grace starts with the Apostle Paul far earlier than Acts 28. What I'm trying to say is this. During that time when both programs are in effect, because there's a time in the book of Acts where both programs are in effect, there are special manifestations that exist during that time that do not exist later. So, for example, in Acts 19, when Paul blesses these handkerchiefs, and they're taken to folks and they heal them, what happens later on in Paul's ministry where he says, for example, in 2 Timothy, Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. Well, Paul, what'd you do that for? Why didn't you just give him one of your handkerchiefs? Did you run out? What happened was there was a dispensational change. Those Miracle gifts that were in effect ceased at a subsequent point in time. My point in telling you that is as you think about 1 Corinthians 11, and we are thinking about chastening, were there some things going on during that time that do not go on today? And the answer plainly is yes, because when you go from 1 Corinthians 11 to 1 Corinthians 12, and it talks about the spiritual gifts, those spiritual gifts have ceased. When you look at Acts 19, which is the context in which 1 Corinthians was written, there's special miracles being performed by the hands of Paul that do not occur today. So, then let me make this point. Since 1 Corinthians is written at a time when there were some things in effect that ceased, maybe chastening has ceased as well, because we know the spiritual gifts did. But before we reach that conclusion, there's two things to keep in mind. With regard to spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians 13 specifically tells you that they will cease, right? Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. So do you have a clear scriptural basis for believing that tongues will cease? You do. But if you recall, when we were looking at chastening earlier, did chastening seem to be vertical revelation or horizontal revelation? It was plainly horizontal. So the plot thickens. Get with me Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 2. Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 2. And we're going to look at the fourth point. And the fourth point is this. Correction requires specificity. So what, what, what in the world do I mean by that? Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 2. Zephaniah 3, 2. She obeyed not the voice. She received not correction. What I want you to notice there is that correction is connected to not obeying God's voice. Get with me Jeremiah 7, 28. Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 28. Jeremiah 7, 28. But thou shalt say unto them, This is a nation that obeyeth not the voice of the Lord their God, nor receiveth correction. We've seen two verses there where correction is connected 
to not obeying God's voice. Get with me Acts chapter 25. Acts chapter 25, verse 27. Acts chapter 25, verse 27. Now, this is, this is what Festus does. Notice verse 27. For it seemeth to me unreasonable to send a prisoner, and not withal to signify the crimes laid against him. Now, why did I take you to... Acts 25, 27. What's the point of that? What's happening in Acts 25 is Festus is sending Paul to another governmental authority. And Paul is being held as a prisoner. And what, he's, what Festus is saying there, it seemeth to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not withal to signify the crimes laid against him. In other words... We have something in the criminal law called an indictment. And the indictment specifies exactly what it is you are alleged to have done. Is it fair, is it reasonable to take someone into custody and say, we're charging you with, with criminal behavior? We're not going to tell you what it is, but we're holding you and we're going to put you on trial but we're not going to tell you what the charge is. Why? That would be unreasonable, wouldn't it? You wouldn't have any ability to defend yourself. You wouldn't even necessarily know what you did wrong. Okay? So that's why when someone is being charged with a crime, there has to be a specific claim as to what it is they did wrong. Otherwise, the person wouldn't know. Right before we looked at that, we looked at a couple verses where correction was connected to not obeying God's voice. In other words, there was something specific they were told that they didn't do. Okay? Go back with me to 1 Corinthians 11. Now I want you to notice something very careful about the way this is written. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 29. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now notice verse 30. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. In 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul told them specifically why they were weak and sickly and many slept. He said, for this cause. If Paul hadn't told them that, would the Corinthians know why they were weak and sickly and many slept? Let me, let, let me ask you this question. Did the Corinthians have only one sin in their assembly? When you read 1 Corinthians, what do you notice? Well, when you start the book, they're carnal and there's divisions among them, right? Someone says, I am of Paul, I am of Cephas, I am of Apollos. Was that a problem? 1 Corinthians 3, Paul specifically says they're carnal, that there were divisions among them. In 1 Corinthians 5, what was going on in that chapter? Fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Oh, by the way, there is some weak and sickliness and, and sleep that is the natural result of having sin-cursed bodies, right? When you go down to the children's hospital, is every child there because God is punishing them for sin in their life, or is it just the natural suffering that, that results of being in a, 
a mortal body. So here's what I'm trying to, get to, to make the point. If Paul hadn't written 1 Corinthians 11, how would the Corinthians know the source of suffering in their life? Couldn't someone say, well, we're experiencing this because there's too much carnal divisions among us, as 1 Corinthians 3 says. Or couldn't someone else say, well, it's because it's just the natural result of having physical bodies that are corruptible. Because that is why a lot of people suffer. Or couldn't someone say, well, we didn't do what 1 Corinthians 5 tells us to with regard to the one that with the fornication is not so much a named among the Gentiles. What I'm getting at is this. Correction requires specificity. What if I did this? What if my son did something that he needed to be corrected for? And what I did is I waited two weeks and I corrected him and I didn't tell him why. That would be idiotic. In other words, if you're trying to correct behavior, what do you do? You are being disciplined because of X. If you're forcing them to guess, you're not correcting them in any meaningful way. It doesn't help them, does it? If I say, I'm punishing you for something you did, I'm not going to tell you what it is. It's kind of like being mad at someone without telling them why. Well, you should know. That is a completely ineffective way to correct behavior. Okay? In 1 Corinthians 11, the Corinthians knew why they were weak and sickly and many slept because verse 30 says, for this cause. Do you see that? In other words, scriptural correction requires that the person being corrected understand what it is they did wrong. If they don't understand that, it's not helpful to them. All right, point number five, are you ready? The manner in which God chastens during the dispensation of grace. In the first section we looked at, what is chastening the equivalent of? What other words mean the same thing? Correction. Excellent. So we talked about the word chasten. Paul only uses that with regard to God's chastening in 1 Corinthians 11.32. But does Paul ever use the word correction? He does. Get 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16. Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. 2 Timothy 3, 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So what has God given today for correction? The Word of God. Now, by the way, let me ask you this. What caused the spiritual gifts to cease? What event? Get 1 Corinthians, so get 1 Corinthians 13 with me. First Corinthians chapter 13. First Corinthians 13, verse 8. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. That doesn't mean prophecies aren't going to come true. It refers to the gift of prophecy ceasing operating. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, 
then that which is in part shall be done away. Get with me Ephesians chapter 4. Now while you're turning there, let me just make this point. The gift of tongues does not operate today. In, in, in Acts chapter 2, when the gift of tongues was exercised, people heard the Galileans speak in their own native tongue. That doesn't happen today. When, when charismatic missionaries go overseas to foreign mission fields, what do they have to do? They have to study those languages. They don't have the gift of tongues as it operated in Acts 2. They just don't. Look at me at Ephesians 4, verse 11. Now, Ephesians is one of the last epistles that Paul writes. Notice this. And he gave. That's past tense. Some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. So those gifts were given for what purpose? To perfect the saints, to make the saints not sinless, but complete, mature. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, same word that was used in 1 Corinthians 13, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In other words, here's what Ephesians is saying when it says, and he gave some, and then it said, till. How was the body of Christ supposed to operate when they didn't have all of Paul's epistles? How would your life function if you didn't have the book of Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians and so on? Would you know everything God intends for you to know today? You wouldn't. So what did God do? Until those books were complete, God gave some apostles and some prophets and some pastors and teachers that could teach the correct doctrine to the saints till they come in the unity of the faith. In other words, those spiritual gifts existed for a limited period of time, and it ended when the Word of God was complete. Once the Word of God is complete, did you need an, an apostle to tell you what you should do, or could you simply read the Word of God? By the way, are there apostles today? There are people who claim to be, but God hasn't given apostles today. Because what did it say? So let's just read it again in verse 11. And he did what? Gave his past tense. And when you use the past tense in verse 11, and then in verse 13 you use till, doesn't it tell you that it ends? It ended. Well, just as the spiritual gifts ended with the completion of the canon, chastening by physical consequences ended with the completion of the canon. Does God correct people today? Yes, of course He does, because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, which means the same thing as what? Chastening. So does God chasten people today? Yes, He very plainly does, but He doesn't chasten them through physical consequences. He corrects them through what? Through the Scripture that He's preserved for us. So think about this with me just for a minute. The reason the Corinthians knew why they were physically suffering is they had an apostle that told them, right? For this cause. When Paul wrote that, he could or, or, or authoritatively declare, Corinthians, of all the dumb things you are doing, of which there are several, the reason why you are weak and sickly and many sleep is because of abuse of the Lord's Supper. And when they wrote that, they absolutely knew. Is there today an apostle or a prophet that can say, the reason you're having trouble in this life, the reason you had that cancer diagnosis is because of sin A, B, and C. 
I mean, think about this. Let me think about this just for a minute. If, if you suffer, let's just take me as an example. If I suffer something that, that's God's physical judgment in my life, I'll just be honest with you. I have too many sins, I wouldn't know which one it was. Would it be pride? Would it be covetousness? Would it be slothfulness? Would it be bitterness? Would it be evil? I mean, who knows, right? How, how would I know which one it was? Well, there's no apostle today that says, David, it's that sin that did it. You remember when Nathan went to David, don't you, about his sin with Bathsheba? He told him specifically what the sin was. David didn't have to wonder about what it was. What about when he numbered the people? Wasn't there a prophet that told him exactly what he did? You don't have that today. How does God chasten people today during the dispensation of grace? How does he correct them? It is through his word. It is not God punishing you in the physical circumstances of life. That's no longer happening. Now, one of the things that tells you then is this. If you don't read the Word of God, you are cutting yourself off from God's correction. Now, what that means then is this. You might think, well, hey, that's great. I don't like being corrected anyway. <laughs> we started this whole thing with correction is good for the person receiving it because it helps them avoid things that will be harmful to them. It's really good as a child to learn not to play in the street. That's a lesson you should take with you for the rest of your life. If you never learn that lesson, if you never internalize that correction, you will make bad decisions in life. Well, the same thing is true. If you don't read the Word of God and study the Word of God and have the Word of God correct you, you will simply continue to make the same errors and mistakes and thus the same untoward consequences will occur in your life as a result of sin. Uh, and I'll, I'll just say this, maybe then we'll close. The way life works, life is much less about what externally happens to you and it's more about the decisions you make. Are the problems in your life primarily external things that happen to you or are the problems in your life that are most serious the ones that you bring upon yourself? The truth of it is, it's your decisions. It's the things that we bring upon ourselves by our own bad decisions. The benefit of having the Word of God to correct us is you can learn in two ways. You can learn by experience or you can learn by precept. Experience is... I'm going to go ahead and do what I want. And I did it, and it turned out to be a disaster. And so I've learned from my experience. Isn't it better <laughs> if you read a verse that says, don't do that? Then you can avoid learning by experience, which is a good teacher, but very costly. Right? And the Word of God is given for our correction. Okay. So does God chasten today? Yes, he does. He corrects people through his word. He doesn't correct them through physical circumstances. That ceased with the close of the Acts period and with the completion of the written word of God. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for the clarity that your word gives. We thank you that we don't have to rely upon our own opinion or guessing about things, but your word has told us what we need to understand. We thank you for that knowledge. We give you all the glory. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Let's stand together.